Hey guys, this is the Yugoslavian bureaucracy by Cornelius Castoriadis. This was originally published in Socialism au Barbary in March 1950. There's a post face at the end that was added to the 1973 edition by Castoriadis. It was written in collaboration with Georges Dupont. Okay, so here we go. Let me get a little silent timer going. I'm a timer guy, you know. Sometimes things just feel like they're like an eternity. I hope, you know. But, you know, you gotta persevere. <laughs> From 1923 until today, the workers' movement has been dominated by Stalinism, maintaining the most highly evolved and most combative sections of the proletariat under its influence. The policy of the Stalinist bureaucracy has been the predominant factor in the outcome of social crises over the last quarter of a century. One of the most significant manifestations of its overwhelming predominance was that during this entire period, it has been impossible to reconstruct in the face of Stalinism a revolutionary vanguard worthy of the name, i.e. a vanguard built upon solid ideological and pragmatic foundation, excuse me, programmatic foundations, and exercising some real influence with even a small section of the proletariat. The principal obstacle this attempt at reconstruction has run up against was the uncertainty and confusion that have prevailed concerning the nature and prospects of Stalinism itself. At the time, uncertainty and confusion were almost inevitable. The Stalinist bureaucracy was still in a, quote, nascent state, end quote. Its fundamental features had barely emerged from the surrounding social reality. It had achieved power only in a single country which was completely cut off from the rest of the world in almost all capitalist countries. Stalinist parties were still, quote, opposition, end quote, parties. Taken, taken together, these factors explain both why the proletariat could not free itself from the grasp of Stalinism during this period, and why the vanguard itself had not come to an understanding of the nature of bureaucracy and to a definition of this phenomenon in relation to a revolutionary program. Appearances to the contrary, the Second Imperialist War brought about a radical change in this state of affairs. The Stalinist bureaucracy has extended itself well beyond the borders of old Russia. It has become a dominant force. It exercises power in a dozen new countries, including both industrially developed regions, e.g. Czechoslovakia and East Germany, as well as an immense backward area, China. The absolute power of the bureaucracy, which might have appeared before us as an exceptional excuse me the absolute power of the bureaucracy, which might have appeared before as an exception or as the result of Russia's peculiarities, has shown itself to be equally possible in other locales. In most cases, Stalinist parties in bourgeois countries have undergone a vigorous development. But by the same token, they have been obliged to share in the, quote, responsibilities of power, end quote, and to assume the role of advocates for a bureaucratic society. Through this considerable expansion, Stalinism has lost virtually all its, quote, mystery, end quote. In looking at the masses of workers, it no longer can be denied that they have begun to experience Stalinist bureaucracy and that they are now experiencing it in a far more profound way than was possible before the war. For the present experience of Stalinism no longer has to do with its, quote, betrayals, end quote, but rather with the very nature of bureaucracy qua exploiting stratum. In the areas where Stalinist bureaucracy has taken power, proletarians have begun to understand its nature, or of necessity will come to understand it. For the proletariat in other countries, doubts on this question are tending to give way to a feeling of certainty, and this certainty is corroborated by an understanding of the attitude and the role of the Stalinist political and trade union bureaucracy within the framework of the capitalist system.
for <coughs> the reason I stopped coughing is because I'm dead now. <laughs> For what there is of a vanguard, all the elements needed to elaborate and propagate within the working class a clear conception of this bureaucracy and a revolutionary program with regard to this phenomenon now have been provided. But even more than in the relations between the working class and bureaucracy, the present period of Stalinist expansion brings to light a radical change in the status of the bureaucracy itself. The bureaucracy has come out of the war infinitely stronger in the material and human potential it has at its disposal, but this expansion has brought to light with much greater clarity than before the bureaucracy's own contradictions, contradictions inherent in its nature as an exploiting stratum. Obviously, these contradictions issue from the radical opposition between its interests and those of the proletariat. Stalinist parties are nothing without the allegiance of the working class, and consequently they are obliged to maintain to deep and to deepen their ties with the latter, precisely in order to be able to impose on this class a policy that is hostile both to its immediate interest and to its historical interest. Thus there is an opposition that is muted at first, but that can only continue by growing more pronounced. On the surface, this opposition is suppressed when the bureaucracy seizes power. It can be said that to the extent it instaurates its absolute dictatorship. It rids itself of the need to have the allegiance of the working class, but in reality, the contradiction is only shifted to a much deeper and more important level, the economic level. There it becomes identical with the fundamental contradiction of capitalist exploitation. If upon attaining power, the bureaucracy no longer needs the workers' political allegiance, it needs their economic allegiance even more. As political agents, the workers can be tamed by the GPU. As producers who refuse to be exploited, they are unstoppable. At this stage, the basic contradiction between the interest of the workers and bureaucratic exploitation becomes materially evident to the proletariat. The bureaucracy's need to exploit the worker to the hilt while also getting him to produce the greatest amount possible creates an impasse that is expressed in the crisis of labor productivity. This crisis is nothing but the workers' absolute refusal as producers, the workers' uh, apostrophe, so workers in plural, the workers' absolute refusal as producers to maintain allegiance to a system whose exploitative character they are well aware of. The bureaucratic economy and bureaucratic society thus come face to face with an impasse that the bureaucracy tries to overcome by increasing exploitation, thus aggravating the very causes of the crisis and by extending the range of its domination. The need to expand bureaucratic imperialism thus follows inevitably from the contradictions of the bureaucratic economy as an exploitative economy. This evolution could be factually observed over the past ten years. It has become evident that the constant exacerbation of the workers' exploitation and the inner necessity for expansion were essential traits of bureaucratic capitalism. It also became evident it also has become evident that this expansion could occur only through the total bureaucratization of the countries that had been subjected to Russian domination. But this process of bureaucratization signifies not only that the contradiction we have spoken of here is becoming magnified, but also that another contradiction is beginning to appear within the bureaucracy itself. Between the national and the international bases of the bureaucracy's power and opposition is becoming apparent. The bureaucracy can exist only as a worldwide class, but at the same time in each nation it is a social class with particular interests. The bureaucracies of various countries, therefore, necessarily tend to oppose one another, and this opposition not only has made an appearance, but has burst out in a violent manner in the Russo-Yugoslavian Russo crisis. Okay, so I'm going to try to do this in one go. The Russo-Yugoslavian break, an expression of internal struggles within the bureaucracy. <clears throat> 
The deep-seated reason for the Russo-Yugoslavian conflict, the opposition between the interests of these two bureaucracies, contained three key elements. First of all, there was the Yugoslavian scheme for a federation of southern Slavs, which aimed at extending Yugoslavian domination to Bulgaria and Albania. Moscow could tolerate neither a loosening of its direct control over the Balkan economy, as would have been brought about by this scheme, nor a strengthening of the Yugoslavian bureaucracy, which already was the strongest of those in the satellite countries. Next, there was Yugoslavia's five-year plan, whose basic objective is, as we have seen, to increase the country's industrial and military and potential. Tito's statements to the Federal Assembly in December 1948 emphasized that Moscow was not in favor of this industrialization plan. The maintenance of Yugoslavia's pre-war economic structure as a country supplying agricultural produce and raw materials or to Russian industry and to that of other satellite countries, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, appears to have been what the Kremlin was demanding. Finally, the current state of economic relations, which take the form of commercial exchanges and Russia's stake in, quote, development, end quote, i.e. its exploitation of the Yugoslavian economy, furnish the third motive for the U russo yugoslavian conflict. The Yugoslavians have become less and less disposed to paying the Kremlin the tribute satellite countries pay out through commercial treaties and, quote, joint business ventures, end quote, with Russia. It is really giving Tito a lot of credit to consider him the only Stalinist leader of a satellite country who has stood up to Moscow. His larger-than-life appearance on today's political screen tends to mask the fact that the Russian bureaucracy's direct emissaries have brought down members of various CPs guilty of or suspected of, quote, nationalist deviations, end quote. <laughs> Need we mention Gomolka, Kostov, and Rajk? Must we list the purges that have followed one after another for the past two years and have occurred on every level? Let us confine ourselves to pointing out how certain Stalinists have learned at their own expense that the, quote, line, end quote, always passes through Moscow, whence come the solutions to each satellite country's economic and political problems. Just as American capitalism's domination of the Western economy does not imply the disappearance of rearguard fighting by the bourgeoisies of various nations, so Russia's subjection of the, quote, popular democracies, end quote, does not prevent some slight displays of autonomous action on the part of bureaucratic fractions from occurring at the same time. In this sense, it may be said that in its march toward world domination, Stalinism carries, quote, Titoism, end quote, in its flanks. The relation of forces between these fractions and the Russian bureaucracy, bound up as it is with the overall international situation, i.e. with the development of the relation of forces between the two blocks, determines the outcome of these conflicts in each particular instance. Nevertheless, we must be more explicit about these ideas, for what is involved in the Russo-Yugoslavian break is the problem of how <coughs> bureaucratic states relate to each other, Indeed, this is one of the most important aspects of the development of imperialism in the present era. Let us recall briefly the essential features of the classical analysis of imperialism as presented by Leninism. The development of capitalism is ruled by the concentration of capital, which forces capitalism to extend its markets and bring raw materials into its production cycle. Within the framework of competitive capitalism, this kind of expansion is achieved by broadening the area of capitalist domination and through a growing international division of labor. Nevertheless, when concentration reaches the phase of monopoly control, possibilities for expansion of this kind start to give out. Indeed, monopolies create, quote, hunting preserves, end quote, for themselves in order to produce raw materials and to dispose of finished goods. From then on, the expansion of each capitalist unit no longer is opposed merely to that of the other units, as was true during the phase of competitive capitalism. It is now faced with a quasi-absolute character, excuse me, quasi-absolute obstacle, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Two closely related problems are posed thereby. 
what will the relations between these monopolies or between the states dominated by these monopolies be? And what are the motive forces that oblige monopolies to pursue an expansionist policy during this period? Despite the, suppressions of the, the suppression of competition in the classical sense, the theory of ultra-imperialism adopted by Kautsky stated that it was possible for the various monopolies or monopolistic states to reach a, quote, peaceful, end quote, intente. Such an intente would... I need to learn how to fucking pronounce that word. I always feel un in lacking in confidence when I say it. Such an intente would take the form either of an amicable amicable division of available hunting grounds or of a peaceful consolidation of capital on a world scale. The violent critique of Lenin directed against this conception did not challenge it as an abstract possibility. In fact, one might add that global cartels, as well as the quote, peaceful end quote, time intervals during which a temporary and provisional division of the world was accepted by the great imperialist powers, are examples of how this possibility was partially realized. But Lenin rightly insisted that this theoretical possibility could never be realized on a universal scale, and in a permanent fashion, for the sole concrete basis upon which such a division of the world or such a merger of national segments of world capital could be settled is the relation of forces between capitalist groupings. Now, because the capitalist economies of various countries and sectors develop unevenly, because new competitors are always coming into the ring and so on, this relation of forces is, a constant, is in a constant state of change. <laughs> Germany, for example, was obliged by the relation of forces existing in 1919 to accept the Treaty of Versailles. But after 20 years, it was able to challenge the, quote, partitioning, end quote, that had been brought about and to call everything back into question. Consequently, only force can resolve the problem posed by the fact that from now on, expansion for some can be achieved only to the detriment of others. Whence the inevitability of wars within the framework of monopoly capitalism, the imperialist, i.e. reactionary, character of these wars, during these wars, it no longer is just a matter of opening new areas for the expansion of capitalist production, but of increasing the profits of one imperialist group at the expense of another, and the political attitude of revolutionary defeatism. But we may ask, why does capital, and more particularly monopoly capital, have this expansionist tendency? Because, says Lenin, of the monopolies felt need to enlarge their, quote, profits and power, end quote. We must not concentrate on the psychological aspects of the thirst of the quote thirst for profits end quote contained in this answer or on the financial oligarchy's will to power, but rather on the very necessities of capitalist accumulation and in the end the indis insoluble contradictions of monopoly capital. Here an explanation is necessary for this question is directly related to the problem with which we are concerned. The contradictions inherent under all forms of capitalist production are simultaneously internal and external. Their concrete expression changes, but their general content remains the same over the entire capitalist period of human history. If capitalist production were not antagonistic in its innermost essence, <clears throat> if it were not based upon exploitation, not only would it be capable of boundless expansion, but it would have no need of foreign territory for this expansion. Conversely, the internal contradictions of ca a capitalist state would lose their explosive character were it not menaced by other states. A, quote, isolated, end quote, capitalist state could allow itself the liberty, barring a revolution, to stagnate and rot in its internal contradictions without its inability to have complete domination over production, creating for it an absolute impasse. But what really happens is the exact contrary of these two hypotheses. The struggle among monopolies and imperialist states does not cease because in the, first and in the final analysis, their profits, and therefore the basis for accumulation, are rival shares that must be drawn from the same overall profit or worldwide surplus value. And this struggle renders accumulation indispensable, whether accumulation is oriented toward the production of the means of production or toward that of the means of destruction. <clears throat>
The internal contradictions of each imperialist state thereby acquire a, a dynamic and explosive character, whether they are expressed in overproduction crises, the falling rate of profit, or the crisis in labor productivity. Under one form or another, the need to break out of this impasse inevitably leads to war. War, therefore, is the expression of the productive force's tendency toward concentration, since it, it results from contradictions that themselves arise from the division and the opposition between different units of world capital. But it is also, and at the same time, one of the motive forces, in fact the most powerful motive force for this process of concentration. This is so in myriad ways. The three most important are as follows. 1. The inevitable merger, first of the various sectors of the economy, and then of economics, politics, and strategic considerations, the inevitability of which derives from the technical condition of modern warfare itself. 2. The elimination through war of the so-called independence of all secondary countries and states. And finally, 3. The crushing of the defeated powers and the need in order to consolidate victory to subject them, as well as the weakest, quote, allies, end quote, to total domination, which may go so far as the permanent military occupation of their countries. Having reached this stage, the struggle among the various elements of world capital, therefore, become more, becomes both more, becomes both more bitter and more radical than was the case under the system of competition, just as the competitive stage does not go on indefinitely, but reaches a first plateau of concentration that it expresses that is expressed in monopoly cap in monopoly control so the violent struggle among monopolistic groupings and imperialist states cannot go on indefinitely under new forms that merely would repeat their previous content each time it takes place at a higher level of concentration thus the first imperialist war upset the existing relative balance among the imperialist powers or coalitions of imperialist powers the new quote partitioning end quote of the world formulated in the treaty of versailles signified in fact the exclusion of the defeated powers from this partitioning the colonies and the spheres of influence of the central empires were annexed by the powers of the entente at least after this victory, the victors had left the vanquished relatively, quote, free and independent at home. And, quote, free and independent, quote, at home. One second. Let's see how that word is pronounced, according to Google. Entente. Entente. Jesus Christ. In the Second Imperialist War, what was involved was no longer the mere, quote, repartitioning, end quote, of colonies. The home territories and the, quote, independent, end quote, political existence of the great imperialist countries themselves were put on the table. Hitler's, quote, Europe, end quote, was the first rough sketch of what the victory of the Russo-American allies was going to bring about. The direct domination of the victors over the vanquished countries from every political, economic, and ideological point of view. The object of the third and final imperialist war that is now being prepared will be, if you will, the same as that of the second one. But this time the objective will be achieved on a universal scale, assuming that the revolution is put in check, the war can end only with the total worldwide domination of a single state. This would be, if you wish, quote, ultra-imperialism, end quote, but with this difference. It would be implemented only by eliminating the weakest imperialist groupings through successive stages in a violent struggle. The mystification contained in Kautsky's concept of, quote, ultra-imperialism, end quote, is to be found in the idea that a peaceful entente, not intente, entente, an amicable, stable division of the world between imperialist states was possible.
Lenin stated that such a peaceful entente was impossible, and history has proved him right. But he was mistaken in thinking that the relations of force among imperialist states would be constantly and eternally changing, and that as a consequence imperialist wars would follow one after another up to the point of revolutionary victory without anything changing except the names of the victors and the vanquished. Just as through competition, which culminates in concentration, one capitalist grouping asserts its ultimate supremacy over others, and this supremacy involves a relation of force that becomes more and more difficult to challenge, so through a series of wars is concentration carried out on an international level, culminating in an accumulation of power that makes it nearly impossible for there to be any subsequent, quote, modifications, end quote, of the relations of forces. In 1913, or even in 1921, disregarding for a moment the question of compatibility of economic and political objectives, many politico-military combinations were possible. The United States, England, France, Italy, Germany, and Japan could have formed many different varieties of alliances, but on the, quote, technical, end quote, plane of war, these combinations always had to result in two or several viable coalitions. If an ally or even one of the secondary states changed sides, the underlying relation of forces might be upset. Today, Russia is the only force capable of resisting the United States. The other capitalist countries could not by themselves form a coalition against the latter. The relation of forces has become too overwhelming. What kind of, quote, modification of the relation of forces, end quote, Within the Western world, can we talk about when France is only able to equip 10 divisions with American manufactured spare parts that it cannot even pay for? Let us add to this that such a coalition is ruled out in advance not only because of the economic interest involved, but also because of the control the two great imperialist powers, America and Russia, have already exercised over the states in their respective zones. Finally, we must not forget the important role played by the United States and Russia's monopolization of 95% of the crucial types of military technology and the economic potentialities that constitute the basis for their power. If we thus grant for that, the that the development of capitalism does not end with its monopolistic phase, and that the process of concentration develops towards a higher phase characterized by the merger of capital and the state at a national level, and by the worldwide domination of a single state on an international level. The question of the relations between states in the present era, as well as the so-called national question, are posed from a different angle than they were in 1915. We will consider briefly the broad outlines of this transformation in order to lay particular stress on the relations between bureaucratic states. The evolution of these relations since 1945 and the Russo-Yugoslavian conflict in particular offer a wealth of material for investigation. 1. In the present era, the economic development of traditional colonial countries and the entry of the colonial masses into action led to a modification of the forms of imperialist domination over backward and secondary countries. The traditional form of colonialism tends to be left behind and is replaced by the formation of, quote, nation, end quote, states of recent vintage. On the, sing on the social plane, this process is accompanied by a relative reinforcement of the local bourgeoisie or by the advent of a, quote, national, end quote, bourgeoisie. But in reality, this formal, quote, independence, end quote, signifies only a growing dependence on the dominant imperialist power. The true import of the phenomenon can be understood only when we see how the previously, quote, independent, end quote, countries, including colonial imperialist powers themselves, are becoming dependent upon American imperialism. Although a very complex stratification appears in the structure of international relations, and is one in which there are all kinds of intermediary forms, the relations between the United States and England, and between England and Nigeria, for example, offer two limiting cases of these types of relations. These differences tend to diminish more and more and to become subordinated to the fundamental opposition between a dominant imperialist state and the mass of countries that have been vassalized by it in one fashion or another. As in every other do domain, 
The purest expression of this phenomenon is to be found in the zone of bureaucratic rule, in the absolute domination of Russia over its satellites. 2. Exploitation through capital exportation tends to be replaced by direct exploitation. The reason for this is that long-term crisis factors in the capitalist economy, as expressed in the falling rate of profit, begin to take precedence over short-term crisis factors over production crises. The relative abundance of capital during the preceding period gives way to a relative shortage of capital. For having been undermined by the crisis in labor productivity, the limited volume of overproduction is incapable of coping with the unproductive consumption of the exploiting classes and the enormous accumulation requirements created by modern technical development. With the sole exception of the United States, and even there we will have to make numerous reservations, the other imperialist countries not only are physically incapable of exporting capital, they are incapable of even resolving their own problems of accumulation. Therefore, exploitation of secondary countries less and less often takes the indirect form of making profits on investments, and more and more often takes the direct form of one-sided levies by the dominant imperialist power on locally produced values. If you hear something, voices in the background, maybe you can hear it. it's my father listening to a uh, last podcast on the left. <laughs> These general considerations provide us with a basis for resolving the particular case of the relations between Russia and its satellite states. It would be completely incorrect to consider these relations identical to the relations of classical colonialism. We are talking here not about the juridical form of this type of dependency. From this point of view, these countries have remained, quote, independent, but about its economic content. Exploitation in these regions occurs not through the, quote, exportation of Russian capital, end quote, but essentially by means of a, quote, tribute, end quote, levied by Russia, though not, though one immediate intermediary or, excuse me, through one intermediary or another, on local production. The satellite countries do not serve as, quote, outlets, end quote, for non-existent Russian overproduction. Rather, their production is directed toward plugging holes in the Russian economy, which is in a chronic state of underproduction in comparison to the Russian economy's needs. If we may use the term, quote, bureaucratic imperialism, end quote, to express state capital's need for expansion while emphasizing the differences between this form of imperialism and that of finance capital, this term is applicable only insofar as Russia's relations of production are relations of exploitation expressing the most highly developed form of domination by capital over labor, and therefore only insofar as this bureaucratic system's own contradictions and fundamentally its inability to resolve the problem of how to develop production based on the intensive exploitation of the producers necessarily lead the regime to seek a way out of its contradictions on a worldwide level. The form and content of a bureaucratic and imperialist power's domination over its satellite countries are determined fundamentally by its own economic structure. In this sense, it becomes clear that since the fundamental economic contradiction of bureaucratic capitalism is expressed through relative underproduction and not through relative overproduction, bureaucratic capitalism is led to seek not, quote, outlets, end quote, but rather countries to plunder. On the other hand, economic satisfaction and planning in the dominant country implies an analogous transformation of the economies of the dominated countries. Capital's penetration into backward countries begins with it, excuse me, brings with it a dislocation of pre-capitalist relations, since imperialist domination is able to exist in these countries only insofar as capitalist relations gradually start to take the place of feudal relations. This in return 
leads to a growing opposition between the new local bourgeoisie, which has de been developed as a consequence of this imperialist domination, and the capitalism of the home country. Similarly, bureaucratic imperialism's domination over other countries necessarily brings with it the elimination of traditional bourgeois relations and the creation of other kinds of relations expressed through stati statification and planning, the only economic forms compatible with this kind of domination. In this sense, what has been called Russia's structural assimilation of Eastern European countries, and which does not signify juridical absorption pure and simple, i.e. the transformation of their economic structure in the direction of the structures prevailing in Russia, was for the Russian bureaucracy first and foremost an economic necessity, independent, so to speak, of political necessities and of these countries' own development. Without this transformation, it would have been impossible for Moscow to exploit these countries on a regular, ongoing basis. On the other hand, this transformation and this type of exploitation bring on the advent, advent of new contradictions. The Russo-Yugoslavian crisis has been, up to now, the clearest expression of these new contradictions. These contradictions express themselves in the latent or overt struggle among various national bureaucracies, and principally between the Russian bureaucracy and the bureaucracies of satellite countries. We could say, reasoning abstractly, that just as the process of capital concentration within a system of competition is accompanied by the contrary tendency toward the, quote, diffusion, end quote, of capital, just as international concentration of the economy and of power advances concomitantly with the forces that oppose it, just as these centrifugal forces on the level of national economy or of the world economy can experience temporary periods of recovery, the law governing the process of concentration signifies only the long-term predominance of the tendency towards centralization over the contrary tendency. So also capitalism's transition to its state bureaucratic phase signifies not the immediate disappearance on the international level, of centrifugal forces and tendencies, but rather de their defeat over the long haul. The basic kernel of this argument no doubt is correct, but it needs to be given concrete expression within current conditions. The advent of bureaucratic capitalism does not take place at just any moment in the history of capitalism, but rather at the precise moment when the international process of concentration has reached its penultimate stage through the division of the world into two blocks, and when the supreme struggle for world domination between groupings of exploiters is about to take place. Consequently, it would be completely mistaken to expect an immediate transformation of all countries into state bureaucratic ones, after which the struggle between these bureaucracies would lead to concentration on a world scale. Times are too ripe for such an evolution to take place. The two processes, concentration on the national level, as expressed by statification, and concentration on a world level as expressed in the struggle for such excuse me, in the struggle for world domination, unfold concurrently in a strictly interdependent fashion. As a consequence, such phenomena as revolt or attempts at revolt by national bureaucracies against bureaucratic domination, in this case the Russian bureaucracy, are natural and organic manifestations of the bureaucracy's constitution into a class in one or another country. These phenomena can occur only by way of an exception, and they are doomed more and more to remain as pure shows of res resistance or muffled, behind-the-scenes disagreements. But these considerations would remain partial and abstract if we did not relate them to the question of the bureaucracy's class nature. The bureaucracy was born and grew up as a class on a national level. It is through the constitution of the modern nation that it found its first, quote, Lebensraum, end quote. And it is back within its national borders that it, is, it has to return when its crisis as a class becomes too intense for it and it is expelled from the world market. The changes that thrust a few and in the end a single bourgeoisie into a position of world domination 
are accompanied by profound modifications in its own economic and social structure, so that it may be said that in achieving world domination, the bourgeoisie itself will be transcended as a class. For the bureaucracy, in contrast, the nation is merely a formal network framework without any genuine content of its own. Its economy is based not upon commercial exchanges with other nations, all of which already have been integrated through the division of labor into an international market, but rather an authoritarian consolidation of every bureaucratic unit under the central command of one ruling bureaucracy. On the other hand, its accession to power, far from being a, quote, purely, end quote, economic phenomenon, assuming that such phenomenon have ever existed, is materially inseparable from a political and ideological struggle conducted on the world level, and from a relation of forces that had also existed on this same world level. It is therefore by nature and in its opposition to the traditional bourgeoisie, an international class even before it becomes a ruling class within, quote, national, bo end quote, borders. Cut off from this international bureaucratic system, only circumstantial factors could ensure its survival. Thus, for example, the Russo-Yugoslavian struggle would have been brought to an end in 24 hours had there not been an international situation that prevented the United States from remaining indifferent to a Russian occupation of Yugoslavia. Let us summarize the foregoing. Russia's bureaucratic domination over its satellite countries derives from the very necessities of the Russian system of exploitation. The crisis of bureaucratic capitalism results from the crisis in labor productivity and manifests itself in the form of a chronic crisis of relative underproduction. The satellite countries are not, quote, colonized, end quote, by Russia in the sense that they do not serve as the site to which its capital is exported or even as outlets for its overproduction. The bureaucracy uses them to make direct levies on their values in one fashion or another. For these countries, therefore, the Russian bureaucracy's exploitation must be added on top of the exploitation carried out by the, quote, national, end quote, bureaucracy. The struggle over the division of the proceeds of exploitation in these countries is at the origin of the open or latent conflicts between these bureaucracies and the Russian bureaucracy insofar as the bureaucracy's international domination can take concrete form only on a local or national level through the particular power exercised by a given bureaucracy. These struggles, just like the conflicts between different factions within a national bureaucracy, are inherent in the very nature of bureaucratic capitalism and consequently will continue to exist as long as the system of exploitation that engenders them exists. Nevertheless, as they continue they will be less and less able to take the overt form of conflict between, quote, states, end quote. And already in the present epoch, this form of conflict occurs only as the exception. The reason for this is the direct interdependence of various techno-economic or geographical sectors of a bureaucratic system, which finds its parallel in the central bureaucracy's direct domination over peripheral bureaucracies, and in the advanced stage the process of international capital concentration has reached, a stage that implied that a relation of forces has been established that confers an overwhelming supremacy upon the dominant pole, in this case Russia, in relation to the secondary units, the satellite states. The basis of the Russo-Yugoslavian crisis is to be sought, therefore, in the typically interbureaucratic struggles over the division of the proceeds of exploitation. What is peculiar to this specific case of interbureaucratic conflict is a series of conjunctural factors that have made the Yugoslavian bureaucracy, rather than some other vassal bureaucracy, the lone pioneer of a revolt that has reached the main the point of view most clear cut. Excuse me. What is particular to this specific case of interbureaucratic conflict is a series of conjunctural factors that have made the Yugoslavian bureaucracy, rather than some other vassal bureaucracy, the lone pioneer of a revolt that has reached the point of the most clear-cut kind of political break. These conjunctural factors involve both the Yugoslavian bureaucracy's own characteristics and the international situation.
A detailed analysis of these traits is only of secondary interest. Let us recall simply that of all the bureaucracies in the satellite countries, the Yugoslavian bureaucracy was the only one to have seized power almost exclusively through its own efforts. It therefore had at its disposal within the country an autonomous and authentic force, and thus had avoided up to 14, 1948, excuse me, up to 1948, Russian control over its police and military forces and over its economy. On the other hand, only the division of the world into two blocks, the relative balance of forces between these two blocks, the, and Yugoslavia's geographical position at the border between these two worlds permitted Titoism not only to manifest itself, but to continue to exist up till now instead of swiftly being crushed. But the balancing act between the two opposing colossi to which the Yugoslavian bureaucracy has committed itself is a very well-defined historical limit, the outbreak of the Third World War. The Future of Titoism What has been said here concerning present-day imperialism, and in particular about bureaucratic imperialism, contains the answer to the problem of what the future of Titoism will be. Titoism is the highest expression of the struggle of local bureaucracies against the central bureaucracy. Titoism, therefore, ought to have expanded at the same rate and to the same extent that the bureaucracy attains power in new countries. But the bureaucracy is extending its power at a time when the international concentration of the forces of production directly raises the problem of world domination for the two opposing imperialist powers. Two parallel processes are occurring. Centrifugal tendencies appear along with this extension of the bureaucracy's power, and there is an enormous growth in the central bureaucracy's strength and power, thus accelerating the process of international concentration. In historical terms, the second of these two processes is the stronger. It is the one that would triumph should the pro proletarian revolution fail. In the end, therefore, we may say that Titoism expresses a permanent tendency within the subordinate bureaucracies, though there is no historical chance whatsoever for it to be realized. This may be expressed in concrete terms in the obvious statement that Yugoslavia, as an independent bureaucratic, bureaucratic state, will be pulverized by the explosion, excuse me, the explosion of the Third World War, and that it no longer will be able to build itself up again in the same way, whatever the outcome of this war. The condition for its present existence is the relative balance of forces existing between the Soviet Union and the United States, a balance that renders the, quote, peaceful, end quote, interlude of the Cold War equally possible. The balance will be tipped permanently to one side by the war and its effects. It is superfluous to explain why a victorious proletarian revolution would signal the ruthless liquidation of the Titoist bureaucracy, and likewise for the Russian bureaucracy and the American trusts. It is just as easy to understand that in case one of the two opposing imperialist powers achieved total victory, open revolts such as Tito's would become impossible. They would be wiped out swiftly if, through some miracle, they happened to make an appearance at all. There remains the question of the possible evolution of this regime from now until war breaks out, leaving aside for the moment the absurd and ridiculous idea that this regime might evolve, quote, progressively, end quote, toward working class rule. We ought to consider how it will fare when faced with the following real possibilities, direct integration into one of or the other of the two opposing blocks or temporary consolidation of the Titoist bureaucracy as a, quote, independent, end quote, bureaucracy. As early as the first few months after the break between Belgrade and Moscow, the integration of Yugoslavia into the Russian bloc appeared impossible. There can be no question of a reconciliation between Tito and Stalin. On the other hand, the violent overthrow of the Titoist bureaucracy on the common form's behalf could not occur through an internal, quote, revolution, end quote, no social forces in Yugoslavia want to struggle against Tito in order to bring a pro-Russian faction to power.
Neither the national bureaucracy, whose interests are expressed in the most direct fashion by Titoism, nor exploited urban and rural workers, who have, uh, having experienced the Yugoslavian bureaucracy, have at the same time experienced all bureaucracy, not what remains of the well-off peasantry, who see in Tito a relatively lesser evil. The Yugoslavian supporters of the common form can can gain recruits only among a few discontented or scheming bureaucrats for whom any action is circumscribed within very limited, very precise limits by Rankovich's vigilant police force. The, f the factors that preclude the possibility of Russia directly intervening in Yugoslavia at the present time, or that would, or that would lead. Factors that preclude the possibility of Russia directly intervening in Yugoslavia at the present time, or that would lead to immediate war <coughs> preparations, if this occurred, are well known. Likewise, we must exclude the possibility of Yugoslavia's being integrated directly into the American bloc. In theoretical terms, this integration would not necessarily mean that the Yugoslavian economy would return to the forms of property ownership and private management prevailing in the West. This eventuality would not be incompatible with the perpetuation of statist forms and bureaucratic power, provided that the bureaucracy bows to the control of American capital and allows it to share in the exploitation of the country. In the present situation, however, this kind of control and involvement is unacceptable. To the Yugoslavian bureaucracy, its revolt against the Kremlin has been predicated precisely upon its will to avoid such a situation. The traditional attachments that bring Western European national capitalist groupings into amalgamation, excuse me, into amalgamation with American capital, and thus make the United States vassalization of the bourgeoisies of European countries more tolerable for the latter are the kinds of attachments that have been disrupted in Yugoslavia, and the most complete statification of the Yugoslavian economy makes it nearly impossible for them to reappear. What counts the most is that during the current period the Yugoslavian bureaucracy has not only the will, which in the end counts for little, but also the temporary but real capacity to resist the process of integration. We can gauge its capacity for resistance only after we have, we, we have discussed the third possible outcome, the consolidation of the Yugoslavian bureaucracy as a, quote, independent, end quote, bureaucracy. In the long run, this, quote, independence, end quote, is impossible for reasons that are economic and political at the same time, and that are only two aspects of the same thing. Ultimately, Yugoslavia can only become a part of a larger system. On the economic level, this signifies that Yugoslavian production is not self-sufficient, whether it goes the route of interstate planning or the route of market-based trade. It has to tie in with the world system of production. On the political level, it will not in the long run have the strength to resist a single imperialist power dominating the whole world. Thus, we are led to take up again the discussion of the theory of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote or rather, of bureaucratism in one country, on the much more concrete basis that the history of the last quarter century offers us. The idea that the construction of socialism in a single country is impossible no longer needs to be proved. Nevertheless, we can be much more explicit about this today than was possible in 1924 or 1927. The criticism Trotsky leveled against the Stalinist, quote, conception, end quote, of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, as correct as it was in formal conclusion, was founded upon ideas that on the whole were mistaken in their content. The principal ideas were as follows. One, every country is dependent on the world economy. This dependence is expressed directly in terms of the competitive weakness of each isolated country on the world market. Two, the result of this dependence is the alliance of international capital and bourgeois capitalist elements in this country, leading to the growing subordination of nationalized industry to private capital, and as a consequence, the possible restoration of the traditional bourgeoisie. Three, finally, the country's dependence upon the world economy 
would have to be expressed above all in its economic or political defeat, in the struggle against its capitalist competitors, and in no case by its victory over them. These ideas completely fail to appreciate the lines of development of the contemporary economy, whose contradictions are situated at a much more profound level than that of the, quote, market and, quote, private property. The Stalinist bureaucracy correctly responded to Trotsky that, quote, the monopoly over foreign trade, end quote, would be able to protect an economy such as Russia's from, quote, fluctuations in the world market, end quote, and that, sheltered by this type of monopoly control, the Russian economy would be able to develop. Only what was able to develop, and what actually did develop in this way, obviously was not a socialist economy, but rather a bureaucratic capitalist one. What Trotsky had underestimated in this case was how the, quote, monopoly over foreign trade, end quote, was merely a form expressing the breakup of the traditional world market during capitalism's decadent phase. By rigorously enforcing this type of monopoly control, the Russian bureaucracy escaped the international division of labor. <laughs> Did this mean that the world economy's predominant position over a national economy had been eliminated? Certainly not. But this position of predominance no longer could express itself through the traditional expedient of, quote, invading markets through cut rate prices, end quote. And neither could it take the form of Russia's dependence upon the procurement of goods it was lacking. And this is due to a factor of, quote, circumstantial, end quote, importance, i.e. the country's huge natural resources. It is obvious that in thus, quote, departing, end quote, from the international division of labor, Russia suffered great losses from the point of view of economic profitability and that, on the other hand, it still was confronted with an extraordinary capital shortage. But it also is obvious that the bureaucracy had to subordinate immediate economic profitability to its overall needs and interests, and in the first place to the imperatives of its existence pure and simple. The solution to the problem of capital shortages was provided by the unbridled exploitation of the masses. Thus the possibility of, quote, private capital penetration, end quote, into Russia, the sole plausible theoretical basis for bourgeois restoration, was eliminated at the same time. For the Russian peasant and the urban bourgeoisie who were ruthlessly pulverized by the bureaucracy, proved incapable of resisting the state-run economy. Russia's dependence upon the world economy eventually came to light in 1941, but not on the plane of the, quote, world market, end quote. Rather, it appeared on the plane of war. The bureaucratic economy was directly reintegrated into the international economy, this time at the level of the struggle for world domination. The Russian bureaucracy came out of this war victorious, thus providing the viability and even the superiority of bureaucratic capitalism as a system of exploitation in comparison with traditional capitalist forms. But in this way, it demolished by itself the theory of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote. The bureaucratic economy had to wage an armed struggle to preserve itself, and the post-war situation proved that the contradictions of bureaucratic capitalism led to imperialist expansion on no less than the than excuse me. The bureaucratic economy had to wage an armed struggle to preserve itself. The post-war situation proved that the contradictions of bureaucratic capitalism led to imperialist expansion no less than do those of finance capitalism. This experience shows, therefore, that the question of whether it is possible for a bureaucratic economy during a given period of time to maintain an independent existence is a concrete question whose solution depends on the configuration of basic factors in the particular situation. In the case of the Russian bureaucracy, disregarding the support the world, mar the world proletariat actively granted to the Russian Revolution, and to those who it wrongly believes are its inheritors, the factors that permitted its initial consolidation and development, and later allowed it to survive the war and win it, were the country's size and its natural resources, the balance of power after Versailles, and the ruthlessness of the conflict between the Western imperialist powers up to 1945. 
certainly no modification in those, these factors would have altered the fundamental development of the modern economy and society towards statification. But they might have changed its tempo and modalities. We must now put this argument in concrete form for the case of Yugoslavia. If the world were made up purely of economics, the bureaucracy in Yugoslavia would be in a desperate situation. Obviously, no comparison can be made between the Yugoslavia of 1948 and the Russia of 1928, either from the point of view of their size and natural resources or from the point of view of their pre-existing level of industrial development. Despite its great dependence upon the world economy, Tsarist Russia in 1913 was the fifth largest industrial power in the world, already possessing an extremely concentrated and modern he heavy industrial base. Apart from significant exceptions, every kind of raw material and agricultural crop existed in this immense country. The outstanding problem was that of capital accumulation and the incorporation of modern industrial techniques. This problem could have been and was in fact resolved by the intense exploitation of the working population, since the physical and human factors for the solution to this problem were at hand. Nothing of the sort exists in Yugoslavia. The fact that, quote, new and, quote, natural resources can now be exploited, and that certain processing industries can be created, cannot mask the following obvious truth. By its limited size, its legacy of backwardness, and its inadequate natural wealth, Yugoslavia could depart from the international division of labor only by maintaining... One section, second. I'm going to follow the save. School is back in session, so, you know, I might not be doing this as much, but, you know, it's... Gotta take time to make time, you know what I mean? I don't know what that means. But I got other reading to do besides the reading that I most so desire to do. Okay. By its limited size, its legacy of backwardness, and its inadequate natural wealth, Yugoslavia could depart from the international division of labor only by maintaining its economy at the level of absolute stagnation. Obviously, this is impossible. The existence of the bureaucracy, even more than that of the bourgeoisie, is in inseparable from industrial development. It is more obvious still that this kind of development will only increase its dependence upon advanced countries. It would be superfluous to recall here the enormous amount of specialization and consequently dependence involved in modern industry and the fact that in the capitalist era, two countries alone, America and Russia, I succeed in creating one way or another a production cycle that is more or less closed in upon itself, from the technical point of view and obviously not from the economic point of view. The quote industrialization end quote of Yugoslavia would be out of the question if this country could not find abroad the requisite equipment and the credits to buy it. Once installed, this equipment must be kept in good repair, replaced and expanded. For the foreseeable future, quote, industrialization, end quote, will never signify a diminution in the country's dependence upon the industrial nations and furnish it with equipment, if it even will signify an accentuation of this dependence from a qualitative point of view. In contrast to Russia, then, Yugoslavia's dependence on the world economy manifests itself, not only in a, deriv in a derivative and long-term way, but also directly and immediately. Here it is not simply a matter of insoluble internal contradictions of an exploiting society. And a defense attack complex that drives toward the struggle for world domination. Already at this time, it is impossible for Yugoslavia to escape the international division of labor. Therefore, it also is impossible for it to avoid, quote, exchanges, end quote, with capitalist countries under the form these exchanges currently take, i.e. the dependence upon American imperialism, where the latter exercises absolute control.
A monopoly over foreign trade could prevent this kind of integration from taking the form of, quote, invasion by cheap goods, end quote. But it cannot serve as an obstacle to the installation of American control over the country. But pure economics is an abstraction. Economics, politics, and strategic considerations are now integrated to such a degree that actions that are absurd from the, quote, purely economic, end quote, point of view are an obvious necessity from the point of view of general interests, the general interests of ruling classes. Purely and straightforward, the economics criteria, economic criteria for judging profitability tend to be replaced more and more by the criterion of total profitability. Judged in terms of the best defense of the universal interest of the exploiting class, interests that are often opposed to, quote, maximum profit, end quote, being drawn from each particular operation and which go beyond such considerations. Thus, in the specific case of Yugoslavia, a whole complex set of political and strategic reasons make it absurd for the Western Bloc and for the United States in particular to lay down economic conditions, even to set any sort of conditions for the aid they are granting to Tito in the form of credits or by lifting, in Yugoslavia's case, the commercial blockade they are trying to impose on the other countries in the eastern zone. That the attempt to obtain the maximum amount of concessions from the Titoist bureaucracy is perfectly possible. That they make these concessions is a that they make these concessions a sin qua non for their aid is absolutely precluded, given that the essential role of Yugoslavia the essential role Yugoslavia can play for the United States is to consolidate the break at a point, key point in the Soviet bloc and to serve as an example for the bureaucracies of other satellite countries. In light of these general factors, the few dollars that American imperialism may be able to pick up in one form or another by sharing in the exploitation of Yugoslavia are of little consequence. Aid to Yugoslavia is earmarked as part of the overhead expenses of preparing for the Third World War. It is by exploiting this situation that Tito will be able to continue his tightrope dance for as long as the Cold War lasts. All right, we got some post a post face here. See also the first section of the general introduction on the evolution of the social situation in countries occupied during the war by the German army, the factors in, that conditioned the extraordinary development of their Stalinist parties, notably in Yugoslavia and in Greece, the relations between these parties and the national bourgeoisie in each country, and the dynamic that led them to seize power and an instrate and instrate a bureaucratic regime in the image of the Russian regime. A. On a number of points, the interpretation of imperialism, the prospects for a third world war, the worsening of the exploitation of the proletariat, the text naturally corresponds to my conceptions of the time, which were revised some time afterward. The same thing obviously goes for the reference to the imaginary, quote, falling rate of profit, end quote. See the first half of the second section of the general introduction, in particular, the question of the imper of imperialism in infinite. The question of imperialism is infinitely more complex than the text or even the quote situation of imperialism and proletarian perspective says. I will turn to this question at length in the the last text. Okay. B. The bureaucratic capital that bureaucratic capitalism gives birth organically and not accidentally to a conflict between quote, national, end quote, bureaucracies, and that this conflict between dominant, exploiting strata has no, quote, progressive social content, end quote, on either side has been demonstrated since this text was written by the evolution of relations within the Eastern Bloc and above all, obviously, by the head-on opposition between Russia and China. It is well known that the latter has had several brushes with armed conflict over the past 10 years. Perhaps it would have been driven to the point of actual war were it not for the two adversaries' common fear of playing the cat's paw for a third thief, the United States. We will leave it to the overly curious reader to find at his own risk and peril the interpretation in the various Trotskyist literatures and to decide whether a, quote, degenerated worker state, end quote, is more or less progressive than a, quote, deformed worker state, end quote. This last pearl having been produced by Trotskyist, Trotskyist oysters. <laughs>
and whether one ought to, quote, defend unconditionally, end quote, Russia against China, the reverse or both at the same time, should the occasion arise. C. The exploitation of the relative balance of forces between the Soviet Union and the United States, sure enough, has permitted the Tito regime a very long survival. This survival has ha goes hand Excuse me, this survival has gone hand in hand with Yugoslavia's increasing reinsertion into the capitalist world market, especially since 1960. So, this post face is written like uh, I think in the 70s. I don't really have a date for it, but obviously, he's mentioning 1960, and the original article is published like in 1950, maybe 1949. This survival has go gone, be gone hand in hand with Yugoslavia's increasing reinsertion into the capitalist world market, especially since 1960. <laughs> Meanwhile, repeated and recurrent attempts at economic, quote, reforms, end quote, which are aimed at re reducing the irrationalities involved in the bureaucratic management of the economy by means of the injection of doses of pseudo, quote, market, end quote, forces, end quote, competition, end quote, have been imposed upon the country. We will return to this in Le Système Mondial de Domination. You know, I'm going to read these, I'm going to read footnotes, so you can turn, you can, you know, switch off your, uh, Thing you know, stop playing this if you want to, but I'm going to read the notes anyway, so I might as well read them aloud. Two, in the sense that this partitioning was not over a given period of time called into question by violent means. We say, quote, final imperialist war, end quote, and not simply the final war altogether. This war, which would culminate in the worldwide domination of a single state, would thereby lay the foundations for a worldwide concentration of capital. And via this route, it would open the way, assuming the revolution is defeated, to historical and social changes that would move further and further away from the present system. We cannot examine here what might be the motive forces and the violent forms of struggle within the ruling class of such a society. One thing, however, is certain. There would no longer be imperialist wars in the precise scientific sense of this term. Thus, for. Thus vanishes one of the last, quote, progressive, end quote, economic aspects of capitalist exploitation. The intensive exploitation of colonial countries and the work and workers in the classical period occurred through the exploit exportation of capital, and therefore through inventiveness investments that led to a certain economic development of the country in question. This development does not come to an end with the present era, but it moves but its motive force no longer is the exportation of capital from the home country. Five. This corresponds to the profound changes the structure of the system of exploitation itself would undergo should this consolidation of the world economy be achieved in a react on a reactionary basis. Six, in a universally bureaucratic society, the chronic and latent character of these struggles would be one of the most significant expressions of its historical stagnation. Seven. <sighs> We will discuss this idea in the conclusion to this article. Okay, that's good. Blah, blah, blah. Eight, and even barring the possibility of a proletarian revolution, the necessity of this restoration. Nine, the few raw materials not found in Russia, for example, rubber, and the highly specialized equipment required for certain production processes were supplied by the capitalist market, which at the time still drew a total, drew a broad enough line between economic profit and political matters so as not to be bothered by the color of Russian money. On the whole, this remains true today. Russia usually made its payments by selling its own products below their international price, the famous Russian practice of, quote, dumping, end quote, independent of their production cost and the country's own needs. Through all this, it must not be forgotten that the value and volume of Russian trade with the bourgeoisie, excuse me, with the bourgeois countries, have decreased constantly since 1929. Editor's note, in the French text, the word, quote, dumping, end quote, appears in English. Obviously, Castoriadis is writing in French. Ten, 
On the historical plane, we already have said that, quote, independence, end quote, in the long run can be identical only with world domination for a single state. 11. Even if for its current needs, its imports it imports much more than an industrially developed country, a backward agrarian country can withstand much more easily a reduction in or a total interruption of the flow of imports by falling back on its own rudimentary forms of production. Such a withdrawal signals the death of industry in a developed country, unless this development already has grown to huge proportions. Thanks for listening.